All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I apologize for being late uh, by a few minutes. So uh, anyhow, we're ready to start our meeting today. And so again, for the record, my name is Dave Yonke. I serve as the president uh, for this advisory council. Um, if we want, we'll start with uh, introductions and go around. And Cheryl, we'll start with you. I'm Cheryl Murga with the Houston Gaps and Air Council, and I represent a planning region. I'm Chuck Rivette with Waste Management. I represent a professional with experience managing a uh, commercial solid waste landfill. Good morning. My name is Scott Trevis. I work with Public Services, and I represent a commercial operations management consultant. Morning, Frank can Pugsley. They next to each other. Sorry, what? I said, can they sit next to each other? <laughs> we normally don't. <laughs> Scott, set actually, up. Scott actually represents something else. He just never remembers. So yeah, I, I have to look it up all the time. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. No problem. Waste Association. No. Commercial operation. Okay. <laughs> all right, Frank Pugsley with Park Hill. I represent a professional engineer in private practice. Brock Lively with the City of Plainview, and I represent a municipality or county solid waste agency. Uh, Richard Bromowitz, and I represent the general public. Steve Shannon, I represent a public recycling organization. Uh, Dave Yonke with New Gen Strategy Solutions, and I represent the financial community. Jeff Mayfield with the North Texas Municipal Water District, and I represent a public solid waste district or authority. Risa Weinberger with Risa Weinberger Associates, and I represent composters and environmental educators. Good morning, Scott Pasternak with Burns and McDonald, representing the general public. Good morning, Judge David Dillard, representing counties under 100,000. Charlie Fritz, Deputy Director of the Waste Permits Division. Megan Henson, Section Manager of MSW Permits. And then I will call the um, council members that are not in person. We have Ralph Gutierrez. And then next is Poppy Hayden. Jennifer Lutz. Here. And who do you represent? I'm with Silver Creek Materials. I represent the land reclamation project using tires. I think that's it. And then I'm Savannah Rains with MSW Permits. And we'll go around and have uh, all of our presenters and people from the public introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Charlotte Pitt. I'm with the Recycling Partnership. Oh, God. Sounds like Allison Owen, Waste Permits. Danielle Lessaker, Assistant Deputy Director, Waste Permits. Roy Lightshoe, Environmental Professional. Okay. And then we also have Maddie Howard helping um, on the tech side. And that's it. Okay. Well, Thank you very much. And again, welcome to everyone in attendance and everyone making it to the change up to the new room. They never, no one went to the the wrong bill. You, okay, a couple people. You didn't, you shouldn't have raised I didn't, your hand. I know what my <laughs> <laughs> well, you still beat me here. So, uh, okay. And so we'll start um, and get the update uh, from the Waste Permits Division update. Uh, uh, Charlie? Okay. Morning, y'all. Um, so a couple updates going on. Um, in case you didn't see it, we do have finally an executive director. They named an executive director instead of our uh, interim that we've had for the last year. So it's Kelly Keel. She was the interim for the last six months there. And she was named the real ED at this point. Um, for updates, so a couple of sunset updates. Posting applications, um, that is something Waste permits, both in MSW and ISW, are, is going to take over for MSW. So we are going to start around May time, maybe a little bit after that, um, for new permit or new applications coming in. Um, MSW waste permits will start posting the application online. 
um, applicants for MSW do not have to do that anymore once we start taking that over. So in our notice documents, it will be links to um, TCQ's uploaded documents. Um, so that'll be probably once that'll be um, new applications as they come in and then the old ones that where you have still posted them um, as those complete so you'll maintain those. So there'll be a true cutoff that we'll do um, like once applications are received after this date type of situation. Um, but TCQ will take that function over. We will still ask for, we will basically be asking for an electronic copy of the application. So we'll take that electronic copy and post it on our website. And then all the links will be to our websites. That will, like I said, May timeframe, we're figuring out all the details of confidential information, PII, like email ad, PII is firstly, personable, identifiable information. Um, email addresses are the big ones in the MSW applications, but bank account information, credit cards, um, we have to redact all that information because we're posting it. Um, so confidential information, PII, um, there's a few others we have to look out for, but we'll be doing, so we'll ask for an electronic copy. We'll redact the information that we have to redact and then post it on the website. <laughs> Do you anticipate there will be, they will be posted on like a waste permits page or is it going to be a, a bigger picture like TCEQ web page for everything? It, my understanding is we're going to keep, that's still kind of in the works. Um, it's going to be, I think we're heading in the direction that we currently have it with the public notice documents. Um, there's a, if you look on our website right now, we're required to, we're required to post the public notices that go out. Um, and for MSW, we have that page where it links to y'all's applications. So we're going to continue, right now we're in the direction of continuing in that similar manner of here are the um, MSW applications. We're still figuring out if it's going to be MSW, IHW, or um, all of waste applications, but there will be some, we imagine either there'll be headings for MSW, or it's going to be a very searchable table um, that have, that you'll be able to search um, MSW and see all of those. Thanks. So we're, and we have to continue, so then we have to continue posting those notice documents like we do today. Um, if you search our webpage, there's a, if you search for MSW pending applications, you can see what we do today. Um, right now, like I said, we're heading in the direction of, you won't see a change to that page other than that link to the application will go to the TCQ um, domain instead of the applicant's domain. So basically there's two ways to get to it. OK, um, the other kind of thing from Sunset is temporary permits um, as part of the Sunset overall, like this was an agency wide um, directive. Figuring out how to. We've had we the agency overall has had several programs just issue authorizations and then there's not a lot of follow up. Um, the big one was concrete batch plants. Uh, but we kind of do have a similar situation with the NOI recyclers. So part of the sunset was um, having all, all facilities, all regulated entities report annually that they're still in operation. Um, it's not a big impact and the kind of the out for most of the programs if this is if there's yearly reporting. So most of actually all of the MSW landfills and processors don't fall under this temporary permit requirement because they support they report annually about the, um, the annual annual waste report or the annual summary. So that's through the discussions on sunset. If you do something annually, including groundwater as well, um, if you submit something to the agency on an annual basis, that kind of kicks you out of this temporary permit. Requirement. So MSW landfills aren't going to fall under this. Um, processors aren't. IHW applications aren't because they have annual groundwater, um, but it, the ones we focused on were the MSW NOI recyclers um, and scrap tires as well, that um, they'll have to, we're building a electronic system of just a simple 
are you still operational type? And the, the recyclers and NOI recyclers and the scrap tires will need to come onto the system, say they're still operational by a certain date every year um, and just fill out that form. So it's going to be a simple kind of yes, no, yes, I'm still operational type situation. So that's what we're building. We're going to start doing some outreach related to all that. Uh, but again, it's just the NOI recyclers. Uh, Charlie, I know it wouldn't be popular for any discussion having them report annual volume while they're at it. We are, we are building the system so we can maybe do that later. We're trying to build it into the annual reporting system that landfills and processors use. Um, that's kind of what our was our requirement to our IT department was was to put into that system. Um, for this first step, no, they're not going to have to do the the reporting volumes, but we we saw that in the future, so we we were trying to get it built onto that system. So it's just a later on include your volumes and out. Okay, and like I said, more information that this is just a heads up. Um, we're starting to work on those systems. Um, we are more than six months away from doing any even close to let you know where the system is, what it is, and all that. So it's this is just let you know far down the road that is coming. Also, the agency is working on um, public meeting rulemaking. Um, chapter 39 houses all the notice information and public meeting details. Uh, this was again to mostly implement um, some sunset types and most of that was air related um, but we're taking the opportunity to look at the public meeting rulemaking and see if there's any other revisions that are needed so that's going to be um, that's not run by waste permits at all that's run by our legal department and so we're just we're in the in the meetings um, that that'll be probably the one the only thing you'll probably see is that when does the public comment period end after a public meeting? Does it right now it ends at the end, the close of the public meeting? It, we're discussing, does it, do we continue for waste applications? Do we continue to have it close at the end of the public meeting or do we follow suit with air uh, 36 hours after the public meeting ends? So, was this tied to some of the transparency issues and that kind of stuff? Yeah. So is it really what you just described? It doesn't sound like more meetings per se, or is that to be determined? It's not so correct. It's not more meetings. It's more about the logistics of the public meeting. Um, like I said, the big one for waste. Um, so all the public meeting changes stem from the air we're actually in the air rules and so air statutes, I should say. Um, anything in sunset about public meetings, we're all directed in the air statutes. So we have to go update our rules to reflect um, the air statutes. And since we could either create this dichotomy of here's air logistics public for public meetings, um, we're looking at it right now of are there things we can do for air, water, and waste based on these changes? So what's um, those type of act, those types of changes. So, and not getting into the weeds, was some of that out of the sunset really tied more to the air side then, or okay. kind of thought so? Yeah. Anything else on public meetings or the temporary permits? I jumped into that one. Um, okay, and then there were some questions about account for 549. Um, so again, at the end of the last session, Account 549, which funds the um, waste permitting programs, um, MSW and IHW, so waste permitting, um, and then also Office of Compliance Enforcement, and then support functions like our legal services, um, IT, so the support capacity as well. So anything waste permitting related comes out of Account 549. Um, the co the regional solid waste grant funding was account 5,000. Those two were combined, um, which did give a large fund balance to the new uh, combined account. We, we combined everything into account 549 now. So we just kept, since that was most of our computer systems were already 
tracking 549, we just combine into that save a step. Um, so account 549 does have a large fund balance. Um, and um, what you'll see basically is that, I'm trying to think how to explain this, but there's how our budget is set up is that in the past, we had a line item for kind of the overall expenditures out of account 549, which was about 34 million. And then a line item for the COG grant program was 5.49 million. So those were two different line items. Since combining, um, those, it will just now be account, account a line item for account 549. Um, so about 39 million. Uh, we do have a separate tracking system internally to track expenditures for the COG program and for expenditures for out of for waste permitting. Um, but that's kind of that's how well that's how we track it for our budget wise. Um, I think the question was about going forward. We are uh, basically how it works is that the agency and I'll I'll jump to the agency's level. So right now we are um, probably in the next couple of months, the divisions, the uh, offices will start preparing our budgets and how the budgets work is that when we're requesting appropriations from this government uh, above us, LB, I, LBB really, it's the Legislative Budget Board. Um, our budget goes to the Legislative Budget Board. So we, when we're preparing our budget, our current budget is the baseline. Um, so our our budget, our appropriation from this biennium is the baseline we start at. And then any uh, exceptional items um, that go above that, we have to request those. Um, so kind of, so generally we continue on with the budget we have this biennium. So the 5.49 million for the COGS will remain in our budget. And we expect to continue to ask for that money um, in our appropriation, in our budget request, and in our appropriation request. So we continue to carry forward um, that 5.49 million. Will that be a separate line item, or is it combined then with this um, the it's, 34 million? It's combined with that now. Will it be identified? It's. I do not. We. We're. This is so new to us. I don't know how we're going to be um, specifically tracking that in text. But when you look at the big balance sheet for across the accounts, the amount of expenditures out of each account, no, it won't be. It'll be 39, 40 million. So the two numbers will be combined in there. Let me just ask a question. It's kind of unrelated to the balance sheet side there, but since you were touching about budget and baseline and going forward, so I know one of the things uh, the last session was getting salary adjustments. So did those, when did those take effect? They've taken effect, I assume. Right. We, so we received the exceptional line request for additional salaries. Um, we actually got those in place on September 1st. Okay. Um, so everybody saw we moved up to the 31st percentile for um, most positions. Um, so that's above the minimum salary groups, about the 31st percentile. So we implemented those. I think we it's still pretty soon. Um, I think we're seeing benefits. And so the, that exceptional item request was in addition to the state the state implemented 5% increase on July 1st, and they'll we'll have another 5% increase next August 1st, August or September, um, maybe July. So we'll have another one in the summer as well. So that was, so there was a 10% increase from the state, and then the agency got a separate increase that we implemented on September 1st. Okay. So let me just ask a question there because we actually did a compensation study, so I learned more about this than I wanted to. But you said 31% of the median. So if I heard you right, but then median is average against benchmark other agencies, or how are you or so each so how are you defining yeah. that? Yeah. State salaries have a 
range set up. Um, so each each class of patient has a salary group, and each salary group has a minimum and a maximum um, for that salary group. So the 31st percentile is it's not the 31st percentile, the median, it's 31st, the 31st percentile of that range. Okay. So it, it doesn't mean you're below the average across the benchmarking with because that yeah. your median and okay. No, that's good. Okay. But the okay. 31st percentile is the low mark. Right. Right. For the, the minimum. Yeah. Like yeah. Midpoint yeah. And max and they're in between the mid and the mid. Yeah. And thirty one percent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. That's pretty good. How is the no. uh, how's the hiring going? Are you hiring? How many yeah. people have you hired last? We've um and it, Megan will get into the vacancies. So, yes. Um it's going I think it is going better. I was gonna like I said, it was it's a little soon to tell. I feel like we've holding on to people more. Um, they are staying longer, which is great news. Um, the ones where we see where we still try to figure it out are the licensed positions, PGs, PEs, um, and I know the attorneys are struggling as well. So it's just those more technical advanced positions that we need to figure out. Um, is it more salad? Just we need to figure out what to do about those. So um, those are the ones we're finding people. It's just taking um, more postings smaller applicant pools so it's we're just trying to figure out how to be um how to just attract more applicants into those pools do you have any estimate of the number of people that you've hired last six months? in the last six months we've we have wait a minute, three vacancies left it's two two left yeah. yeah so it's it's look it's trending better um, it's definitely trending better. We'll see. We'll be tracking retention. That's the one I'm. Um, but we haven't had anybody leave in um, a couple months, which is good news <laughs> for us. So um, maybe it's just short term bias, but I feel like the retention is getting better. It's just the, the PEs and PGs are vacancies are staying open longer because it's just small applicant pools. Um, so if y'all. Always, if y'all know of anybody that wants a state job, PE and PG positions available, um, let us know. We'll walk them through the process. But those, those are just the ones we struggle with of just small application folds, so they stay longer. Thank you. Dave, I have a question. Yeah. So on the going back to the budget, when you submit it to the um, LBDG, LBD, yeah, it's dyslexic. So sorry, um, but. Is there a way that stakeholders can look at that? Is there any transparency or is it, how does how does somebody view it? What is submitted? So before we, so we're, we're starting to gear up for the divisions, putting together their budget request, submitting it to our budget and planning division. Um, the budget and planning division around the summer, late summer, so August, July to August to September, um, actually has to present the proposed budget to the commissioners. Um, so it's it's at an agenda meeting. There's backup documentation showing here's the proposed budget. The commissioners um, have to act on it at an open meeting, so at an agenda meeting. So that is probably the best time to see the information and um, provide comments because that is an open meeting. It's fairly late in the game. And based on past experience, there really is no room to make very many changes. It seems like it's at the division level. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's, it, and it's kind of up to, the ED makes a proposal and then the commissioners um, review it and make a decision on it. So prior to the open meetings, there's no transparency on what has been submitted internally to the ED. I yeah I don't know we've never I've met we waste permits has never had a request like that before because like at mine we have three public meetings on it that we have a lot so I wasn't sure how the state agencies do it but that's helpful thank you okay. any other questions okay. is that everything on your post-it yes okay <laughs> all right thank you very much
Uh, and then moving on, Megan, uh, we'll have an update from the MSW permit section. So starting with vacancies, we have only two vacancies left, which about six months ago, I think we had eight. So we're in a much better position. We have some documents to, you know, like a training syllabus, onboarding syllabus, um, good resources for our new staff to jump right in so they can be uh, caught up quickly and hopefully move to landfill and registration applications, which is obviously the most complex that we have. So the two that are remaining, it's one engineer and one geologist position. So these are both posted at entry level positions, but they do require a license. So that goes back to what Charlie said about kind of the difficulty of filling the position, um, the GITs and the EITs, so the uh, geos in training or engineers in training do not qualify for these positions. So uh, it's a it's an interesting situation to be in, but you know, state has great benefits. So hopefully we can keep recruiting people with that. Um, and of course, there's room to grow as well. So if you know people, please reach out. I know we've tried to go to the PG board. Um, I think we may have reached out to like AS, ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers uh, to get them to promote, but uh, word of mouth is usually the best. So feel free to promote our vacancies. So we can work faster for y'all. Megan. Uh the list that was sent out just still has four vacancies on it. So there have been two filled in. Two have been filled. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, the two vacancies are where? One is going to be a PE. Right. So that'll be uh, under Burgess? Yes. Okay. And then the other is the EPS also will be under Burgess. Okay. And that engineering specialist is actually a geologist. Any other questions on vacancies and staffing? All right. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> it's really nice. It is. It is. <laughs> hey, I, I do have one question. So if you're in EIT, how long does that take? If you have a someone that's a EIT, how long would it take typically for them to get their license so you could maybe fill it internally? Do any of the engineers know that? I guess three years with a master. Yeah. Four years with a master. Three years. Minimum. Yeah. If you're <clears throat> experienced. If you're, yeah, if you're gaining design experience that the board deems applicable. So the four years is a minimum if you've got a bachelor's. Yeah. Mm. And we do have, um, that's something we offer people is to actually uh, take the test and get the EIT and have you know, get their experience with the agency to then apply for the PE and take that test. Same with the geos. So we actually have a geologist in training on staff. So do you have any engineers that are EITs right now or? Not right now. Okay. We have in the past, so. Okay. It used Thank to you. be that the board required that the experience, that the years of experience that the person had had to be design experience. And supervised by a PE. And supervised by a PE. So I'm surprised that they would take a nice time at the agency. The EITs and they were doing construction yeah. supervision. Yeah. They weren't doing design, so they had a hard time. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. For major applications under review, we have 26 permits and three registrations. So that's pretty consistent. Um, that also includes subchapter T permits, those development permits, overflows, landfill as well as landfill permits, major amendments. So those are moving along. And then the uh, maybe one of the best parts of having almost fully staffed uh, list here is that we have enough staff and time and workload balance to have additional activities that benefit the regulated community and the public. So we have a few projects that we're working on. One is revising that's used to submit the soil liner evaluation reports or the slur form. Um, this form hasn't been updated since 2008 and there's a business need because um, we have a 14 day review time frame uh, for the agency and we have deficiencies or we'll identify deficiencies and we want to make sure we're setting up the landfill operators for success that you're not getting that on day 16. Yeah, we want to get it to you before. 
Yeah. Um, so hopefully with the form updates, we, we can um, ask the right questions, get the right information when the report is submitted to us, and that we can expedite our review on those. So we're in the process right now of revising the language, making it clear, again, making sure we're asking the right information, and uh, also the instructions, making those clear. And then we're going to do the geomembrane slash geosynthetic aligner evaluation report form as well. And the goal here is that we get the slur form done and get a, our language cleaned up, and then we'll do the GLIR similar, you know, go through the revisions, and then we'll change both of those to a billable PDF and publish them at the same time. That way consultants don't have one updated, nice, pretty new form and one that's maybe a little outdated. So um, probably be about six months to do that. Again, just balancing workload, making sure we're focusing on the right things. So then when you publish those, then those will go out for comment uh, or... Typically with our forms, we move into publication. We'll do some testing to make sure all the form fields work correctly. Um, and then it's because we update our forms. If someone identifies issues that we didn't catch, we can fix those pretty quick as well. Is that something so, and I don't know how it, the process, but is that something where if you put something together, is it easy enough to just show it to some of the engineering firms or what have you just to get any feedback or something? Yeah. yeah you know, I don't know, that might be beneficial. And sure. yeah, we can share it. At you. I would have to look at it. I asked yeah. Uh, yeah. like a beta to some of the new yeah. forms, yeah. and that would be. Sure. And these aren't, we're not looking for, most of these aren't going to be substantial changes to the information y'all yeah. provide. So we hadn't thought, I mean, we probably weren't going to, we weren't thinking about running it by you because it's not substantial changes. Some of the instructions, there will be changes to the instructions. We're going to try and provide more instructions. Um, but if that's a need, we could we definitely find, identify some people or share it here. So um, we're not we're not doing an overhaul of the the information. It's just more one changing it to a fillable PDF and then looking to improve our instructions. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's going to be substantial <clears throat> changes to what you all provide, the concepts of what you provide today. All right. Currently, the instructions kind of tell you how to put in a soil liner, and that's really not what the instruction should be. It should be how to fill out the form. So we're looking at that basic level of like, in this section, provide this information. You know, one question, sure. and, and this has happened a couple of times, but when does the clock start? Is it with the uh, electronic submittal or the paper submittal? Because I've been told both. Whatever is received electronic. first. Yeah, okay. And complete, completely. Complete. Yeah. But if we submit that and Say, for example, what gets here, uh, someone's working remote, they don't get it for a week. Does that mean that the, because that's what has happened mm. in a couple cases? It's received by Waste Permits Division. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions on that particular project? Any other questions? And we are having our, our team is made up of a PG and PE who are also providing input on the form to make sure again we're asking the right for the right information. All right, and next up we're also going to have a webinar in spring. This is going to be before trade fair, and this is covering data sources related to MSW permits. So we have tons of data available publicly, but we're not great at uh, promoting it and how it. How it can benefit, again, the public, regulated community, consultants. So we're going to actually have a webinar where we, where we just walk you through. Here's what this data is. Here's where you can find it. Here's how you may want to use it. Um, and then also covering our web content control. No, web something. We call it WCC. I don't actually know what it stands for at this point, but it's our um, online database, filing database. So the records that are open to the public that you can access from the comfort of your home or office without having to come to TCEQ. So that way people again know like you can get reports on there, you can get permit applications. Um, there's lots of good stuff on there. So we'll walk through how to use that system as well. So we'll announce that through our MSW newsletter, put it on our webpage, MSW webpage when we have a date set for that. That's just a great idea. <laughs> oh, thank you. Glad to hear that. 
And then next up, we're also preparing for trade fair. I think I mentioned last time the trade fair is in May. We start preparing uh, November every year. So thank you so much for the feedback that you all gave. The case studies would be helpful. We are going to move forward with that. So we have a couple of case study presentations. Uh, one is on landfill gas exceedances, and the other is on um, waste acceptance plans and remediating or removing prohibited waste. So those are going to be the two case studies. We're also going to have a presentation on composting as well as uh, activities over the closed landfills. So we've kind of been touching on this in different ways. This, the subchapter T is what you're, we usually refer to it as. Um, last year we covered the more detailed technical requirements for building over landfill. And this time we're going to actually walk through the requirements for the authorization, uh, which is where you first get started all the way to a development permit and uh, follow projects from the first phase all the way to the development stage, stage or phase. Um, so that'll be a good one. And then we're also going to have um, our tires presentation that's going to be a little different than it has been in past years. And we're going to cover projects funded through the regional solid waste grant. So lots of good topics this year. Uh, the full agenda should be made available in a month or so. Seems like it comes out pretty, pretty quick. So yeah, we're excited to keep working on this. Any questions on trade fair? Dates. MSW is May 14th. That's not quick. That's not quick. May 14th. And then IHW will be May 15th. And of course there's water, air. Um, OCE presentation. So there's a lot to, if you don't just want to come and listen to MSW, um, there's other people that are presenting as well. <laughs> and I'll add that this is the last year, last year for a couple years that it'll be at the Austin Convention Center. Um, they're redoing, remodeling that after this year. So for the next, I think, three to four years, it's going to be in San Antonio after this year. Megan, how do you decide which of the sessions qualify for continuing education? We have guidance. Uh, the agency provides guidance on that. And I want to say this year, it's the landfill gas remediation, the waste acceptance plan, and the composting. Okay. Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the guidance said. No, I mean, they, they give it, of course, on the, on the, um, the program. Uh, for many, many years, uh, it wasn't restricted. If you went to any of the sessions, you got CEU credits. Mm -hmm. And I had some people ask me about that because there were presentations they really wanted to see that was topical, maybe on oil and gas or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they don't get any CEU credits for it. Okay. So I just wasn't sure is that something that's reviewed on an annual basis or just kind of roll with the flow? Or, and you, know, you may want to just consider if there's anything topical that's not. Really hard or in the box. So what? If it's educational and it broadens people's professional perspective, let them, let them have a shot at getting credit for it. Okay, we can look at it. Um, we'll Otherwise, I have to run from one room to the other and fill out two forms. And yeah. Are you talking about <laughs> PE or the, the uh, operator? Uh, operator. Anything. The PE is really loose. The PE, I use turn if it's cheats and they kind of trust you to go to the classroom. But uh, the Operator's license has become very restricted. Okay, we can look at that. All right, the last uh, topic I have today is the HB 3060 update. So, uh, WPD is continuing to work on the draft language for this rule change. And again, uh, HB 3060 is a bill related to advanced recycling. So, we're taking advantage of the opportunity to not just get update our rules based on statute, but to also clean up some rule citations in 3.30 that were out of date. So, you know, one rule changed over here. We didn't catch that it still sends you in another part of the rule. If you've uh, worked with MSW, you may have experienced that where you're trying to trace that line there. Um, so, yeah, we continue to work on the, the language there and also still working on the mass balance attribution section. So that's still underway. And uh, we're looking at proposal to the commissioners in late spring of this year. And then a formal public comment period will be in summer of 2024. 
and then adoption in fall of this year. That's all I had for that update. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, moving along. Uh, next up, uh, we've got a presentation, uh, the business and program services section update, specifically with the Swiffer Green update. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, a couple of things that we got going. Uh, one of the things is that it's time for the uh, for our scrap tires uh, annual activity reports uh, to start coming in. And these are uh, uh, from uh, transporters, from uh, different uh, scrap tire pr processing facilities, also from our storage facilities. So uh, earlier this week, we sent out about 670 letters reminding folks to go to our website uh, to fill out the forms for reporting. Uh, they'll need to report the number of tires that they managed from January 1 of 2023 through December 31st of 2023. We're looking for calendar year uh, reporting. Uh, they'll have to report the number of tires that they managed, as well as uh, the facilities and how many tires they sent to certain uh, end users. And so uh, all that is due by March 1st. We'll have a, a couple of outreach messages that will go out to them as reminders. Um, and so that's what's going to be going. On. So get questions or something out there from scrap tower facilities. That's what they're going to be looking at. Has this report always been on an annual? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Has this always been on an annual basis? It's always been on a. Yeah, we're covering the annual, right, as opposed to the fiscal year, fiscal year. Yeah. Uh, of the six hundred and sixty letters, how many reportable entities does that cover? Uh, six hundred and sixty, or, or uh, like, are there you know three to one company or? So, uh, so first, so the uh, if you're, for example, if, if you're a uh, uh, processor that also does transporting, uh, you you do have to uh, 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 account for the number of tires that you transported, and uh, if you process some of those or processed all of those, uh, we don't we try to make sure we're not double dipping there on on the number of, of, of tires managed. But there are some transporters that have a small processing. Uh, operation, but also transport to other places. And so we'll want to make sure that uh, that they cover both of those. Bottom line is that we also want to make sure that uh, all that matches with the final uh, the final use that they, that they send it to. And so we do a lot of QA on that. Um, out of the uh, 670, we'll get on the average uh, about 280 right in that right in that. Uh, uh, and that, that also includes folks that are saying, uh, hey, I didn't do any any activity for this year. And so we make sure that they did. And, uh, so there is some QA, uh, but that is out there. And so just in case you get questions about it, just know that it's again for, for uh, 2023 annual. So, uh, so that's one of the things that's going on. Uh, oh yeah, uh, no nominations were accepted over the last two months. We didn't get anything. We're continuing to work with our stakeholders and our partners. I know uh, the Texas Association of Regional Councils TARC did have a blurb in their newsletter. Uh, so we are continuing to do outreach as much as we can to, you know, uh, fill the other three positions. So we are continuing to work on that. Uh, let's see, Swiffer. So Solid Waste Infrastructure for Recycling Grant, the federal grant. We finally got approval uh, of our work plan from EPA. So we've started to, to look at projects. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of challenges to, to this. It's, it's uh, you know, one of the first grant, federal grant programs that our group is has been working on from start to finish. So we have to learn a lot of things, um, but also the timeline is very concise. There's a end date of August 31st, 2025, and it's a drop dead date. So no extensions, no ability to, to move that money. Um, and so we really had to uh, look at COGS that uh, had the, I guess, the bandwidth, you know, to be able to to, to fill out, to, to, uh, to work the, the projects. And so we've gotten some good uh, project examples. <clears throat> um, all the projects are, they can be replicated. And that's the great thing that we're looking for, to get projects that, 
then uh, either local governments or other COGS could replicate. We're looking at a couple of uh, composting type of projects, uh, working with school districts and the food waste that, that school districts get. So uh, we're looking at that. Uh, we've got one, uh, uh, one project that is looking at uh, commercial and uh, uh, institution solid waste and trying to build inroads in that for recycling. And so that's another good one. Um, we also have another one that's looking at rural recycling centers and uh, assess, making assessments on those as to how they can be more effective, how they can be more efficient. So um, we're continuing to review those. We're hoping to finalize here pretty quickly, uh, looking to get into contracts with the uh, uh, with the five COGS that we've selected, probably sometime around July, uh, and then have those projects start July, August of this year, and again, run through uh, September, or I'm sorry, August 31st of 25. <clears throat> Any questions? Can you share the five COGS at this point? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, East Texas, which is the Tyler Longview area, East Texas COG, uh, Lower Rear Band Valley uh, Development Council, which is, uh, I think, the, what is it, uh, Hidalgo, Willacy, Cameron Counties, uh, HDA, Houston Galveston Area Council, uh, CAT COG, Capital Area, and then North Central Texas COG. I think that's five. Yeah. The grant is four hundred seventy-one thousand uh, dollars. So, um, and uh, and of course, these cogs are also working on the uh, regional solid waste grant program. So they're kind of fitting this into their schedule, uh, into their work plan. So really feeling good about it. Really, really feeling good about the projects. Again, uh, designed to be replicated. And uh, they also all uh, touch on the regional plants that we just adopted last year. So really looking forward to see those projects get started. Mr. Okay. So, Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so just one thing I, I'll just pass along. It, you mentioned, you know, hoping to get them started in July. The one thing I would just, you know, my two cents, I would try to move that up about three months because my if there's a hard deadline in August of 25, my experience has been if, you know, if it starts in July, that means an entity's under contract with the COG. There, if anything's moving slow and getting it started there or getting data, that 12 months can go pretty fast. And then all of a sudden you're up against a deadline. So, um, and depending on the type of project where you're trying to gather data, uh, meeting with folks, any stakeholder, you know, meetings, that 12 months goes really fast. That? Yeah. Okay. So, um, HJC is one of the COGS. Um, Santos's team has been really, really flexible. Each of the COGS talked to their executive directors, and I think all of us have permission to start doing the work up front, even without the notice of intent. So, like for example, HGC in February, we're releasing our um, RFP, and we will have it in place by August first or September first, because <laughs> um, that's when the so the COGS all know that, and TCQ has worked with us on that. So I don't think that's going to be a problem because the five COGS. As he had said, had the bandwidth, and we all have had the permission from our executive directors to move quickly. And we, our procurements are on board, our legal is on board. So the COGS have done some pre work too. Good to hear. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, it's not our first rodeo for so, most of these. <laughs> so, so we're going to go through the, through the, we have to go through the contract process. And Got so it. we're, we're trying to speed it up as much as we can. In fact, we're already meeting with, with our interior, our, interagency folks on that right so uh optimistically if we can do it earlier I mean, we're going to shoot everything we got to it to to get it earlier uh but really uh we've set that date that that july date as being this is the date by which we have to have it gotcha so we can get it that earlier we're, we're shooting for it earlier. and it's a very detailed timeline they gave us so we know when we have to go to our board of directors so all five have been working very diligently to meet with that. And um, Santa's staff, I mean, the week I worked the week before Christmas and New Year's and their staff was very busy. We were back and forth finalizing our scope. And so 
we are all very cognizant of that. And this is, the, as he mentioned, the first federal money they've gotten in a while. And we want to make sure that the TCQ is set up for success in case the Solid Group wants to go after other money at the TCQ to federal level. We want this to be a good program for them. Yeah, the experience of working on federal grants, that was one of the criteria that when we looked at COGS and, and what their bandwidth was, uh, just because the the workings of that of the federal grant are somewhat a little different than than our grant contracts here at TCQ. And so we wanted to make sure that they had worked on them before, had that experience. Um, and so that was definitely something uh, that we looked at, as well as the percentage of, 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 uh, of time that they already had dedicated to working on our grant, uh, because we knew that this was going to be something else that they were going to have to fill in. Uh, and so that was definitely another criteria point that we looked at. Cool. Yes, sir. Of the 471, does TCEQ retain any for management? No admin costs. Okay, good. No, it's straight, uh, yeah, it's straight pass through to, to the okay. COGS. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and also, you know, talking about the COGS, they've also have uh, uh, taken on that approach as well, knowing that it's uh, the best use of it will be program money. Uh, and again, to address some of the uh, initial strategies and objectives of the plans that they just that were just adopted so great thing about it is that a lot of these projects really point to that uh, on the recycling part also on waste minimization so yeah uh, really looking forward to it i think it's, it's going to be a successful uh, project and if inquiring minds want to know hgac is the rural recycling center assessment looking at efficiency and like that that's us in case you wanted to know. <laughs> Most of the deliverables for, for all five uh, are toolkits that, that will be able to be replicated. So that, that was kind of one of the things that we kept pushing uh, is that we're only, you know, there's only five projects that, that we want to replicate, be able to be replicated. Do you need to seek authorization or approval from the federal government once you've selected the projects or has that already been delegated and you once? It, it's, it's delegated, but we've been working very closely with them. Uh, yeah, to make sure that that the projects that that, that we're looking at, uh, the deliverables that 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 are going to be, uh, you know, at the end are are going to be something that meet the uh, meet the requirement. Right. Would it be okay if I um, North Central Kansas City has a fabulous um, mattress refurbisher? If you were to, a lot of cities would like to do mattress refurbishment. Um, and they would be a good cog if you were to do that as a yep. you have a question. Yes. Can you say who the two compost projects are that you said you're looking at? Uh one of them is here in uh, capital area cog. Uh and they're working with some five five rural counties. Uh and then uh Low Rio Grande Valley uh development. Yeah. One of the other criteria of the grant. Uh, was rural uh, rural areas, and so uh, and disadvantage and, and disadvantage. I'm sorry, disadvantage in rural areas, and so uh, uh, that was the other thing. And and uh, uh, again, um, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of those areas across the state, and so uh, that's you know that was that was another criteria that we had looked at. Can I add one more? Sure. And no data collection. No that that um, you did have to rethink how you were yeah. thinking with that. Um, so there was no data collection. Yeah, I remember because our last quarterly meeting, you had mentioned yeah. that, which was a little bit of a twist. Yeah, and and, and the other thing too was was uh, you know all the data collection has already been done by the Cogs in developing the regional plan, and so for a lot of that, it felt like we we're going to be you know maybe duplicating effort again, and so. Uh, uh, yeah, that's one of the things that, that we did look at it and were able to work around. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Any other questions? I actually forgot to mention my update. Uh, Santos mentioned talking to TARC and promoting the council vacancies. We also reached out to the Texas Municipal League since we have uh, vacancies related to municipalities. So hopefully that's fruitful if any members are members here and a part of the Texas Municipal League. You're our voice to get our municipalities represented. So 
be sure to promote our council. Okay, thank you. Um, the next item, so every couple, you know, couple weeks before the meeting, two, three weeks before the meeting, we get together and kind of look at the agenda. And so this next item was one I think that Scott had uh, suggested when we reach out to council members. So the recycling system initiatives and grant funding opportunities. Uh, Charlotte's here uh, to speak on that. Scott, did you want to give any quick background on that? Why you selected that or asked for that? Sure. Yeah. So we're just uh, very much aware of the great work that the recycling partnership is is doing, not only on on a national basis, but I think more importantly here in in Texas. And I think Charlotte will elaborate on this to where uh, TRP is has got a very significant focus on looking at what can be done to uh, enhance and improve recycling programs all across the state of Texas, and they have the combination of various types of, of assistance programs that Charlotte will, will talk about. Uh, we've been fortunate to be able to provide some consulting assistance to the recycling partnership and are, are really aware firsthand of the grants that, that they are making and would like to make available to local governments in, in Texas. So yeah, I think it's a, a great opportunity and that'll create some additional opportunities to, to really continue to uh, increase recycling in Texas. Yeah, thank you all so much for making time for me. Um, I greatly appreciate it. I am Charlotte Pitt. I'm the director of grant development for the Recycling Partnership. Um, I've been in the role now for a little over a year and a half. Um, I have a background in municipal operations, uh, ran the city and county of Denver's recycling and waste diversion programs for about 22 years. Um, and so, as Scott said, we are um, making efforts to, to meet and learn about what's happening in Texas, to look at opportunities, and then also to make everyone aware of the, the offerings that we have. Um, so a little bit of background for those of you that don't know the Recycling Partnership. We are a, a very unique national nonprofit that is um, highly hyper-focused on system change for recycling. Um, we believe that recycling is part of the climate solution and part of our resource, natural resources solutions. And we, um, we have partnership in our name because we know that no one entity can solve the problem. And so we are working across the supply chain, across the country to try to advance and improve recycling systems so that they work correctly and that people will have trust in them and that people know about them. Um, so that's a little bit about us. I work specifically on a team called the System Optimization. We, um, we look at how can we help local communities and local governments manage their waste systems and improve their recycling systems. Um, we, are, we are strictly focused on traditional recyclables, cans, bottles, paper. Um, we have not sort of jumped into the composting world or the hard to recycle materials. So we're really looking at big system change. Um, uh, for those of you that know some of our work, um, one of our key reports that we release every couple of years is our state of recycling. Um, we just released the 2024 yesterday, so if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you go and look at it. Um, we collect data from across the country. We collect data from our grant projects. We try to develop scalable and useful best management practices in the work that we do with communities so that it's fully transferable. Um, a lot of this is done, and a lot of the research that we do is done through delivering um, strategic grants across the country. Um, we have what we call a sort of a standard line of grant making, um, and then we also have the ability to custom it. I will say we are a fairly young organization. We're approaching 10 years, um, and our teams are constantly growing. Our grant team Two years ago, moved from just two people working in the grant program to now we have a community granting team and a MRF granting team, and we now have seven people working um, on grant making across the country. Our bread and butter is um, cart grants. We know that when you put recycling into a cart and you collect it automatically, you will get more material out of the system. Um, we have just designed a um, rural recycling drop-off 
grant that's not even on our website yet, but I have an RFP available for folks in rural areas, and I couldn't help but hear the Swiffer recommendation. I'd love, we love the opportunity to co-grant where we can. Um, typically, our grant funding supports a community somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the, the funding needs. And so where we can work with state granting or COG granting, um, we love to make those dollars go further. Um, we just with the Swiffer grants coming out, um, we partnered with the city of New Orleans to co-write their grants application for a universal curbside service. They were a successful recipient and we were able to match their dollars um, to make that possible. So we're always looking for creative opportunities to, to partner with, with folks around the country. Our priorities when we come to grant making are always looking at where can we get new access? Where do people not have access to at-home recycling, whether that's single family or multifamily or rural drop-off? Um, we look at new tons. How can we deliver new tons into the system with our grant dollars? Um, hub and spoke in rural and sort of semi-rural areas, um, drop off efficient scalable learnings, and then best management practices. We really try to look at how can we create opportunities to teach people how to get from zero to 100 without maybe taking all the steps in between um, and learning from other communities. Um, we... We have right now about $31 million deployed and on the street across the country. Um, since 2016, we've been able to work with a number of communities in Texas. We've delivered about $4 million worth of grants just to the state of Texas in the last couple of years. Um, we currently have the Fort Worth project still in motion. Um, we've got a number of CART grants, and then we're working on a multifamily project in San Marcos. So just a little bit of some of the work that we've been able to do here. We would love to see this increase. We see Texas as a key opportunity state with a lot of material still available and ending up in landfills. So what does that system change look like? I mentioned that um, you know we look at best management practices. We do a lot of capture studies across the country to try to understand what households are doing and what changes behavior. Um, this is just sort of a standard access grant that um, we know that once you move up the scale, you're able to capture more materials per household. And what we also know is there's about 800 pounds of traditional recyclables in the average household across the country. And so these are just some tactics to get more of that 800 pounds into the system. Um, and then we know you can't just deliver recycling cards or recycling drop-off center and expect people to use it. There's a layering approach and it needs to be sustainable. Um, what we know about recycling, that if you don't communicate with your community, people will forget about it. People transition, you have new residents, new people moving, and unfortunately systems across the country are different. You can't expect someone moving from LA to Austin to understand how to use it. So there's this constant need for, for ongoing improvement um, and layering those strategies. Um, and this is what we think at the partnership, this sort of the picture of success looks like for a thriving system. And there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Um, and there's a lot of different players within that puzzle. So um, just to take a quick look at the current landscape, there are nine across the country, 9,000 different types of programs and 30 plus thousand communities. And all of those orange dots represent opportunities for system change. So there's a lot of work to be done in improving recycling. And then when you drill that down to Texas, we also know there's a lot of opportunity for improvements. Um, our estimate is that a oh let me skip that one. Our estimate is that there's still lots of room for improvement in every area across the community supply chain, whether that's access to recycling. We know there are communities that don't have access that are in urban areas for curbside. The rural challenges, transportation challenges, because Texas is so big, is one of uh, is a big challenge to overcome. Um, 
there's some decent access in some of the large municipalities, but there's some definite need for additional education and outreach. So um, our estimate is there's about, you know, 50% more work to do. And so we'd like to be part of that solution. Um, this is what we're focusing on. We are doing a deep dive into Texas and Louisiana. Um, last year, we did a recycling assessment for the state of Louisiana. Um, and Louisiana is very different from Texas in that there's very little access to, to recycling and infrastructure and MRFs. Um, but we really want to take a really good look at sort of the, the system and access and then the education and communication and optimization of the programs that are in place and then the infrastructure needs as you look at growing programs. So this is really the focus of what we are doing in trying to get the word out about our work in the region. Um, and the ultimate goal for us is we would really like to see a bigger pot of dedicated grant funding for the Gulf Coast region, pretty much from Texas to Alabama. There's lots of opportunities to improve recycling. So. What we've been doing for the last couple of months, and I know I've met a lot of you in various capacities over the last couple of months, is to really put a good picture together of what the needs and the opportunities are by spending time with folks here on the ground, understanding what some of the challenges, the opportunities are, what some of the barriers are. And then really, to be quite honest, we are hoping to sort of seek this sort of five to 10 year plan of what would a really robust grant funding program from the Recycling Partnership look like to really help move the needle in Texas? Um, so that's what we are doing um, and interested in learning. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or feedback, um, take some feedback. We are um, Spending, I'm going to be spending a, another couple of weeks in Texas over the rest of this month. We're actually hosting a lunch and learn workshop with a couple of the COGS. We're working with Cheryl to host one in February um, where we can talk to community members. We're going to be hosting one with North Central Texas actually in two weeks. Um, so, um, so we wanted to share that with you and let you know that we're here and a resource and available and then anything we can do to support, we'd be happy to. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, uh, two quick questions. First of all, can you provide the presentation to like Megan or someone to distribute it? Because there's a lot of good information there. So appreciate that. And so you talked a lot about the programs. You talked about the carts. Just kind of curious, you talked about MRFs, though. You work with the MRFs also, and I've seen it in some of the, you know, email newsletters, et cetera. But can you just chat briefly what you do on the MRF side? Yeah. So um, right now, our MRF granting program is very focused on equipment grants. Um, we have a number of material coalitions um, that um, we have a, a PET recycling coalition, a polypropylene coalition, um, and an aluminum coalition. And we really look at how to capture more of those materials within the system. So most of our MRF grants right now are focused on equipment. How can we help um, a MRF by helping them purchase a piece of equipment, say an optical sorter, that will either help capture more of that specific material as it goes through the system, or may, maybe improve like yield loss so they're not losing as much as it goes through the system. Um, with the idea of delivering more of that material back to the end markets, um, very much focused on where can we get bottle to bottle or where can we get improvements to to dry to clean up the material that's already coming in. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, two questions. Um, when you when you um, send the uh, uh, presentation, can you also send the link to your study? So yes. everybody can get a look at it. Yeah. Also, how do you coordinate with like um, GPI or CMI, uh, GPI being the Glass Packaging Institute, CMI being the Can Manufacturers Institute, but also provides MRF grants for the same thing, right? GPI for better glass recovery, CMI for better aluminum recovery. Yeah. Or is there coordination? There is coordination. 
I, I can't go into huge detail about it because that's not my area of expertise, but we have folks on our team that are working with those groups. Um, CMI is actually on our board of directors, so um, and they participate in these material coalitions. Um, yeah, so through that way. It's, it's through that way, yeah. And so we have teams of folks who are also working across the supply chain. We have folks that are working with the brands and packaging manufacturers to look at recyclability too. Um, one of the programs that we're in the process of launching is a, it's a recycled check program. And I, I didn't bring it today because that wasn't really my focus, but the concept is a, a QR code on a package that is tied to our national database. And we are we released last year a solutions hub that communities can sort of manage their their list of acceptable materials. We think we know what it is, but they can fact check it. And then the idea is if you're in the grocery store, you can scan the QR code on the packaging, enter your zip code and understand if it's recyclable in your community. So that sort of supply chain piece of it is where we're really working because the folks who make the packaging need that packaging back to meet their sustainability goals too. You also didn't make them the film and flexibles, which is what I, I participate in. So yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> but yes, we have four coalitions right now. And and we aspire to have more. I mean we would love to have each material you know a coalition for each material. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for being here. And I'll stick around after if folks have specifics. All right. Next up, uh, we've got the groundwater report. Yes. Um, so I'm Allison Owen. I am a work leader in municipal solid waste permit section. I oversee the work group that handles all of the groundwater reporting that gets submitted to us. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about a project that's been in the works now for a couple of years. And I'm excited that we're at the point to uh, alert the public to it and even get some public involvement. Um, before I kind of unveil what we've been working on, I'm just gonna talk real quick about kind of how we got to where we are um, and where this project originated. Uh, so groundwater reporting is a requirement for most of our permitted facilities. And so they do groundwater monitoring and submit their groundwater monitoring reports to us for review, and we also provide response to all of those reports. So in MSW, we see over 500 groundwater monitoring reports a year and have about 10 staff members that handle all of those reviews. Uh, IHW sees a little bit less. They're in the ballpark, I think, of 100 groundwater reports a year. And so right now with the current format of how we receive reports, there's some challenges associated with that. Um, one major challenge is just inconsistent formatting from one facility or consulting firm to another. And so that uh, significantly adds on to the onboarding time for a new staff. So we can train them up and you know teach them this how you approach a groundwater report uh, and then hand them a very similar report from a different consulting firm. And it might as well be the first time they've ever seen a groundwater report just because it appears so just. And so uh, with that also, um, it affects our more seasoned staff, uh, just not able to kind of maximize their efficiency of review uh, because some reports just by the way they are prepared and the information is communicated, it just makes for a more difficult review. Uh, and then also a challenge is all of this information and data that we're getting submitted in these grammar reports essentially lives in those reports. It's in a hard copy uh, binder report or in a PDF document. And so if we need to refer back to um, information from the past or the current statistical limits, um, alternate source demonstrations that we've accepted in the past, we have to refer back to those older documents uh, to see what went on in that report. And so um, to tackle these challenges that the project managers are seeing, it was proposed to come up with an electronic reporting system 
for groundwater monitoring reports. And this would allow for a consistent summary view to be uh, provided for each report type. So that's gonna allow us to more quickly onboard staff because they're gonna be seeing the same data summary for each report type, um, increase that efficiency, and then also have that data more at our fingertips readily available to reference uh, should we need it uh, when we're reviewing current reports. And so those are the benefits to us, but there's also gonna be benefits to the users of this uh, new program. And that being that the system will have automatic data checks, uh, data validation, um, as well as we're gonna be able to, through better efficiency, uh, provide responses faster. So better planning for your next sample event, you'll know how um, the agency is responding to proposals for action in response to exceedances or uh, any recommendations we have that might affect what you're sampling for. Um, so with that, I'm gonna show you um, some, walk you through the, the user, the external user, um, what we've developed so far. And I just wanted to emphasize that this is very early on in the development phase. So we started um, with the design of the internal system back in February, 2022. And up until just a couple months ago is when we switched to the external user uh, interface and all of that. So what you're seeing is very new. Think of it more as like the concept uh, that we're going for, what we're envisioning, uh, but the details of the mock-ups are very much uh, like placeholder text. Things might look a little off. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of refinement that is happening here, um, but I wanted to give you all the visual of letting you know what we're moving towards. So this will be the initial login to uh, steer the steers groundwater reporting um, system. The user will indicate whether they're submitting reports for either IHW or MSW. And then it will pull up all of the uh, facilities associated with that user's um, steers profile. And then they'll click on the permit number of uh, the facility for which they want to be submitting a report for. Uh, the next screen would be uh, where you select the type of report you would want to be submitting. Um, for example purposes, um, let's pretend you clicked a routine monitoring report. And then um, it's going to take you to a screen where you're going to be uploading data files. So we're generating templates um, of the information that uh, is going to be reported for the report. And then um, there'll be on-screen instruction of what is required for that report type, um, links to download the template if that user does not already have that at the ready. And then they will um, upload from their computer the different required files. So the files that will be uploaded are going to be in an Excel format. And so this is just what a completed uh, monitoring data uh, file would look like. It's all information that is already being provided on currently our 0312 forms. So essentially it's the 0312 form broken out into two different um, Excel files. And then there'll also be an Excel file for assessment, monitoring and corrective action wells because they have an additional statistical information that's required and then an Excel file for the QSUM um, should the facility utilize uh, QSUM values. So then at this point, when all of the required uh, files are uploaded, the system will run a data validation check. And so it's gonna be checking for specific parameters that we have set. So for example, if you were uploading a monitor, uh, a new monitor well, and the latitude and longitude said that that well is in China. The uh, system would let you know that hey, you have an issue here um, where this uh, well is located. And then it will also do like facility level information validation. So um, like if the, the system doesn't have record of a monitoring well um, for that facility, and then you were trying to upload monitoring data for a well, it would say, hey, there's no record of this well. So 
um, catching things like that um, before it even gets uploaded to the agency. So um, it will let you know all of the different errors it found, and then you have the opportunity to re-upload corrected forms. Um, and then when there's no issues or errors detected, um, it will take you to just a summary screen of all of uh, the data that is being uploaded into the system. And so then at this point, the user would advance to a similar screen um, that is mirrored off of what the internal uh, view would be for the project manager's review. And that was a design choice because we want to make sure that uh, the facility or consultant that's uploading really is seeing essentially what we will be seeing. And then um, at the bottom of that screen, um, this would be generated. So this is uh, what we're calling the exceedance summary, and this is generated by the STEERS program. So it uses information um, stored within the system about the facility to recognize um, exceedances from that monitoring event. And then the user will use the drop down menus on the side to indicate their proposed action with regard to every one of the exceedances. And then they would advance forward to um, providing PDF attachments for the report. So this is not a replacement of, you know, how groundwater reports right now are prepared. We would still be getting that groundwater map, uh, cover letter, narrative discussion of, um, you know, what went on during that monitoring event, as well as complete lab data report. Um, so here is where all of those PDF attachments would be uploaded. Uh, and then the user would advance to another screen. Um, if you ever used SEERS before, it's just the standard, you're certified that you are who you say you are, and you have, um, you know, the ability to represent that company and submitting information for them. Um, and at that point, we would get an email that a groundwater report has been submitted and we would assign it to a project manager for review then on the internal side um, of uh, the application. So um, as I said, we're still very early on in the development phase, especially for STEERS. Um, so the next steps for this project um, is the continued development of the internal and external side of the programs. Uh, we develop what's called use cases, the mock-ups as, you, as you've seen, and then uh, internal testing for the internal side of the program. We're anticipating um, the development of the internal side wrapping up this spring, and as well as that will be when we conduct our internal testing. STEERS development is going to go into the fall, and then at that point, um, we would be doing some external testing. So kind of tandem with the continued development, we are gonna be working with a stakeholder group. Just last week, um, we put out our first notification of the stakeholder group uh, requesting volunteers to participate. And our stakeholder group is gonna have two main functions. They're going to um, be providing feedback on templates for data migration. So as I said, the system relies on um, information like facility level information that it needs to know to conduct certain checks um, and validations. So there's gonna be an initial large data migration of getting the facility set up with that uh, required data. And so we wanna hear from stakeholders of how do y'all store your information? Um, what is gonna you know, be the most user-friendly format for these templates to make for a painless data migration um, phase? And then also get that external testing. So um, that will happen later on um, when the uh, development of the STEER side is winding down. So that would be in the, the fall of this year. And um, once the stakeholder group is formed, uh, we will move forward with the um, conversations about data migration templates. So we anticipate that to be within the next month or so. And then finally, there's gonna be the implementation of this a new system. Um, we're going to have to be creating uh, guidance documents, instructional documents. We're going to be hosting webinars to make sure everyone um, is well trained in the use of this new system. I anticipate this being on a trade fair topic next year. Um, and then notification of to the facilities. This is not something that's going to be sprung overnight. Uh, facilities will be well informed that um, this is coming in the rollout of it. 
Um, and then, like I said, the, the data migration, um, that action. So, um, like I said, we are looking for participants for our stakeholder group. Um, simply email MSWPER if you want to be involved in the stakeholder group, and then we will be reaching out uh, soon about those action items of uh, data migration and uh, user testing. If you want to stay informed on this but don't want to participate in the stakeholder group, just sign up for our newsletter. We'll be using that to uh, deliver more information as um, this project proceeds. And so to do that, just go to the agency website and click sign up for updates, and then make sure you're subscribed to uh, the news from MSW or news from HW, whatever uh, one you prefer. Um, yeah, that, that is all I have prepared for y'all. I'm happy to answer any questions about this new system, if y'all have any. Well, I really appreciate it. It's very informative. I think you'll probably get a couple of volunteers from here for the, the stakeholder group, but uh, that sounds great. I'll just open up any questions, comments. You're looking at like a, a year full implementation, at least. Likely. Um, so it would, I imagine um, it's going to be uh, on a voluntary basis as soon as we have it live and available for you. So you want to you know, see people starting to utilize it. Um, and then I, I don't, we haven't talked yet about honestly what time frame here will be mandatory. It won't be mandatory on day one. There'll be a rollout period of getting people to try it live outside of the test group, um, get feedback on that, see if anything. And then, so it's, it, and especially what's difficult about this is that a lot just do annual. So it's kind of a, it's not something you do every month, every week. So it's it's going to be a long rollout period. Okay. So I, what, I thought I was following, but maybe not on the actual physical reporting components, maybe. So when it comes time to upload the data, would it be similar to what's currently in place for certain air reporting where you can have your consultant log in on your behalf, upload the info, and then you get a notification as the permittee and you validate, or I can't remember the exact term that's used. Is that how that would, one scenario, and I suppose the other one is you could just as the permittee go through the effort to. Yes, um, we are you know, anticipating that it will be the consultants, um, just like they submit reports right now on uh, facilities behalf that they would be able to use steers on behalf of the facility. Okay. Would, would there be a valid, a permittee validation step two, or would we just have the author, somehow there's authorization provided to the consultant and they can just upload it? And I, there would be some sort of authorization step. Steers has a, the RP regulated entity can enter the information, or you can assign somebody to enter information on your behalf. Um, it is a very, I'll say robust system. So it, I think you, I, I've never done it, sorry, but it's one of those where I think you have to assign somebody, give their name, their email address. They have to go sign up for an account. And that's the only, per, like, that's the only person that can do it. So you can authorize additional people, multiple people, but they will be the only one. So if they're out sick and it's due today, they're going to, it's got to, and that's just for security reasons to make sure somebody's authorized to submit government reports on your behalf for your facility, but it does create some um, bottlenecks when due dates come up. And I think then there's a login and a password that the owner has to go in and then certify that yes, right. I'm the, the yeah. person. I'm sure you do that. Yeah. No. Y'all, stairs, I mean, we use stairs for the annual reporting. Yeah. So a lot of you, I mean, so it's the same system. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Right. Allison. I, real quick, I, yeah. I, I will say that, like Allison said, we're putting a stick together, a stakeholder group. The one thing we're, we kind of didn't mention, but we do want some feedback on too, is that we're setting this up where, as Allison explained, that the, um, hopefully the information you collect is the same. It's just you're reporting it to us in a different format. The big importance for us is that spreadsheets. Um, with all the data. And I, we know you get the information from the labs. So it's going to be kind of a in conversation with all of us of um, how can we start getting the labs to report 
the data to y'all, the consultants, in this format. So all you have to do is um, upload it to us. Um, if we can get there, the rest of the system's easy. It's still the same narratives. It's still the same explanations. Um, and but that the Excel data is what helps us do all the automatic. Helps us. It helps you all do all the automatic checks. Of what's going on? All right. Thank you for that. Anything else? Allison, thank you very much for the presentation. Okay, moving on. We're a little behind, but uh, you know we're down to the final item. Um, I need to get an approval. I've read through the minutes from October 12th. I didn't have any other comments, but I need to get an approval. So if someone that's reviewed them wants to make a motion. Okay. We have a second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. So the minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any action items from this meeting. Any final questions, comments? What about public comment? Is there any public comment? Oh, I yeah. probably should have asked it earlier, but I was wondering if staff or anybody's aware of any potential interim charges that might be coming down the pike? I had that on my list and then took it off. Um, <laughs> I forgot to talk about it. <laughs> okay, well then. Good. No. Okay, yeah. Um, for MSW bills, I'm not aware of any interrupt charges coming up. Um, that doesn't mean we can't get thrown in there. Um, last second, something happens, but MSW related, no. I have heard some discussions about um, coal fire power plants. Um, and so we got brought in because of the CCR coal combustion residual program. Um, but that's more on the industrial waste side. So nothing MSW right now. Okay. Good. I went kind of fast there. So thank you for reaching in there. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so is there any public comment? Tell you what, if you want to, yeah, just uh, give your name and uh, if you've got the data, give it to Megan or, yeah. I I just got it together last night. So okay. I'll, I'll email. I could, or someone wanted to, um, it's just on the five cities that um, are tracking their garbage per capita. I have updated from 2023. So, Great. Yeah, I mean, Megan, can you distribute it to the council and then we'll have that along with the uh, the PowerPoint. Great. Thank you very much for that. And yeah, if you can just get together with them afterwards, that'd be awesome. Thank you. OK, um, let's see any other public comment. <clears throat> Not seeing anything in the chat. If there's anybody on the phone, you can use star five to raise your hand. A couple seconds. Not seeing any raised hands. Okay. Thank you. Um, so our next meeting will be uh, April 11th. I'll be on time. Uh, and so I appreciate this. Can I have a, a motion to close the meeting? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, see you in a few months.